imagine waking up one day and seeing that one of your basketball mixtapes has gone viral, reaching millions of people. Well, that's what happened to these guys. Well, for the players that we're covering today, this sudden success was a reality that shot them to the top of the basketball world. Unfortunately though, this fame can disappear just as fast as it came to them, leaving them to find a new path to follow in life. But that still begs the question, what happened to them? I did some research and I was surprised by what I found. Is there a better way to start this video than with a member of one of the most hyped up prospect families in the history of basketball? And so, covering the product of LeVar Ball's genius marketing, we have his second son, LiAngelo Ball. We all know that it was impossible to be a basketball fan without being bombarded with highlights from every single one of the Ball brothers' performances back in 2015. I mean, did we ever see three brothers playing together on the same team, absolutely destroying the opposition? Out of the three, LiAngelo has by far the biggest frame, which he used to bully players offensively and score from anywhere on the court. From spot up shots to straight up forcing his way to the rim, he was doing whatever he wanted on offense. LeVar would even go as far to say that his son was stronger than Zion. Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. Now, obviously, this was just part of LeVar's marketing scheme to get his sons into the league. However, still though, LiAngelo's strength was undeniable. Still, during high school, he would find himself a bit behind his brothers regarding talent recognition, so he'd end up as only a three-star recruit. The fame was there, which helped him get a few college offers. The one he would commit to, though, would be UCLA, just as he was ready to make a name for himself in the basketball world. Things wouldn't go as planned for him, as his college career would be much shorter than he hoped, and not for good reasons. The thing is that during the preseason international tour that the Pac-12 held in China, LiAngelo and two of his UCLA mates got caught stealing Louis Vuitton glasses. This would not only result in a one-year suspension for them, but literally risk going to jail in another country. This would end up nearly causing an international crisis as US diplomacy and Donald Trump had to intervene to help them avoid getting imprisoned and get them safely returned to the US. As he returned to American soil, LiAngelo decided there was no way he would spend one full year not playing basketball. So he decided to go with Lamelo to play professionally in the Lithuanian league to prepare for the 2018 draft. Unfortunately, this would end up not going well as LiAngelo would break his ankle in Europe and end up not being drafted. He would find himself forced to play in the Junior Basketball League founded by his own father. There he would start showing some of that LiAngelo magic that we saw in high school, as he dropped a couple of 50 point burgers and led his team to the title and got finals MVP. This would get the interest of NBA scouts for the second time around, with multiple teams getting him to join their summer league or training camp squad. This would not net him a spot in the main squad of these franchises, however he would still show enough to play in the G League where he is still, to this day, a part of the Hornets G League affiliate, the Greensboro Swarm. I mean, he didn't succeed like his brothers, with both Lonzo and LaMelo having been top two picks in the drafts. But still, LiAngelo's NBA dreams are alive, as with enough work, he could hopefully get a spot in the rotation of one of 30 NBA teams coming soon. Guys, take a look at this slam cover from 2002. To the right, you have a player considered by many to arguably be the greatest in the league's history. And to the left, you have this guy. And for those who don't know him, this is Sebastian Telfair. At the time, they were both seen as the next big thing in the world of basketball. Straight from Coney Island, Sebastian was the number one player in the country in every one of his years in middle school. Still, his fame would only really shine during his time in high school at Lincoln Academy. He would quickly become one of the most sought after prospects in basketball, even becoming the youngest player ever selected to the Adidas ABCD camp. Sonny Vaccaro would even say that Sebastian was one of the most brilliant high school players that he has ever seen. Oh, in case you were wondering who this Sonny guy is, he is none other than the man who signed Michael Jordan to Nike back in the 80s. Anyway, at the time, everything was lined up for Sebastian to become the next big thing. He would end his high school career as a five-star recruit, win the USA Mr. Basketball Award in 2004, and even managed to become the all-time leading scorer in New York. He was such a big sensation that stars like Jay-Z lined up just to watch his high school games. Every single college wanted a piece of him. At the time, players were still allowed to go from high school straight to the NBA. And with Sebastian wishing to get his family out of the projects as quickly as possible, the decision was very clear. He declared for the 2004 draft. He also signed with Adidas for a $15 million shoe deal to kickstart his future as a star in the league. However, there was a small problem. Well, a big problem. His game just didn't translate to the league. I mean, what it came down to was he was a six foot guard who was really fast, but couldn't really defend and couldn't really shoot. 
Now, while this didn't make him a bad player, it more just meant he wasn't going to be the next big thing in the NBA. It just meant that that star level wasn't really in his future for the NBA. He would still play in the NBA for a total of 10 seasons. He would find a role as a journeyman guard, as he played for eight different teams during his tenure in the league. And he would finally retire in 2015, having made enough money to live and retire peacefully. That unfortunately was not what ended up happening to him, as from there on out, it was only the beginning of the problems for him. Now, Sebastian had already gotten into a few legal troubles during his time in the league, like when he got caught driving way over the speed limit in 2007, or when he pleaded guilty to criminal possession of a gun in 2008. But that would be nothing compared to what happened to him in 2017, when he was sentenced to three years in jail for yet another weapons possession that would end up in an appeal that is still going on to this day. And to make matters worse, in just 2021, he would get caught in a fraud scandal with 17 other former NBA players, like Tony Allen and Glenn Davis, after they had allegedly tried to defraud the NBA's welfare program. For someone who was once said to take over the league with LeBron James, takeover is far from what actually happened. We now have the profile of a different type of player, Connor Williams. Standing at only 7 feet tall and weighing a bit over 370 pounds, to compare, a prime Yao Ming weighed about 310 pounds at 7'6". Now your first thought when you see this guy would be that he has a bully ball playstyle, using his big body to just go through every single defender in the way. But that actually couldn't be farther from the truth, because believe it or not, despite his big build, his most famous highlight tapes are actually of him giving dimes and making threes. We're talking about one of the biggest players in college basketball, playing with the same finesse as a six foot guard. He enrolled in St. John Fisher's D3 basketball program, where he would fill up the center spot. In 2021, he would have his moment of glory when a clip of him exploded online during an exhibition game versus the University of Buffalo. And you can see it right here. Connor tripped up, rolled his ankle, and still managed to get up and finish the play with a beautiful pass right under the rim, giving his teammate an easy dunk. He would start receiving praise from every corner, with his coach even saying that he was lucky to have him on his team as it felt like he was having another coach on the court. His fame would get even bigger when a series of interviews done with him would show how nice and down to earth he is, earning him more than 40,000 followers on Instagram. A few months later, another highlight of him would surface, but this time it would be of him knocking down threes. Connor has been doing his thing in college, balancing basketball and a cybersecurity major, all while hoping that he maybe gets that NBA call someday. Still, this guy also seems to have business in his blood by making sure to cash in off his newfound viral success. He knew there was no better time to monetize his image and likeliness than when he had national spotlights all over him. And so he worked closely with numerous companies like Barstool Sports and DXL, even going as far as making signed player cards available on the market. Oh, and we can't forget about his big heart because despite being a college student athlete, he is very implicated in charity work and giving back to his community. Connor took his viral success as a perfect opportunity to sell branded sweatshirts and give a chunk of the sale to a local charity organization. We appreciate you, Connor. As we've seen throughout this video, getting a taste of early basketball success doesn't necessarily translate into making a living out of the sport. Well, unless you're an early bloomer like a kill car, the Baltimore native was must watch basketball during his high school days. During his high school days, with every single news outlet of the region praising him and presenting him as a future great of the sport, Despite only being 5'6", Carr was one of the most electric players in the entire nation. His quick first step and 48-inch vert allowed him to dominate players who were far bigger and stronger than him. He would even posterize players that he had no business doing to. Every single highlight contributed to his rapidly growing fame, with mixtapes online earning millions of views and helping spread his name. During just his sophomore year at Patterson High School, he would cement his status as a Baltimore legend with numerous incredible performances, like when he carried his team to win the Christmas game special with a 57-point burger bomb over Forest Park beating on the same occasion his school's all-time scoring record. He would even lead his school the following year to win a state championship. Man, at that point, Akil was turning into something much bigger than basketball. He was turning into a Baltimore native legend. His high school even started to relocate some of the games to the arena in Morgan State University, since Patterson's gym couldn't fit the thousands of people that wanted to see him play. This would lead him to earning one of the most unique nicknames ever, as Carr was called the Crime Stopper, literally coming from the fact that so many people wanted to watch his games that the crime rate was lower on game days. As you can guess, when you reach that point of fame, chances are that the entire nation knows about you. And let me tell you, that was exactly the case. And in 2011, Akil would get selected to represent the USA Junior Team in an international tournament in Italy. And there, he did one of the most carry jobs in history. 
averaging 40 points per game and leading USA to a gold medal. He impressed the Italians so much that they even offered him a $750,000 annual contract before he even got out of high school. So he had to decide, pros or college? And according to him, he opted out from college, even though he had over 28 scholarships to play all over the country. To everyone's surprise though, Akil wanted to be under the lights of the big league. He would forego his college eligibility, going to play in China first with retired NBA legends. Things didn't work out overseas, so he went to play one season in the D-League with the Delaware 87ers, where he still ended up having issues with the team. So right after that, he declared for the 2014 NBA Draft. The problem he faced is that short guards are some of the most undervalued prospects for NBA teams, so the 5'6 guard would find himself undrafted. From there on out, he would go abroad to keep playing the game he loved, playing some seasons in Canada, then in Cyprus, before finding his way back to the USA, and playing for his hometown's team, the Baltimore Hawks in the ABA. And well, one thing's for sure, it's that he didn't lose an ounce of talent, as he got selected as an ABA All-Star just last year. As good as a player can get, one saying is repeated in the basketball world, that you can't teach height, which would unfortunately spell the demise of Akil's NBA hopes. What happens when you shut down a young viral prospect? in front of millions of people. Well, you become a viral sensation yourself. This is the story of Michi Terry, the six foot defensive oriented guard who was a central part of the St. Edwards Eagles when he played with them, even helping them reach an Ohio State Finals Four appearance. He was a true hound on the court, always being the one player to do that one hustle play that was needed or just take the opposition's best player. Every single scout profile compared him to Pat Bev, with him being an aggressive on-ball defender and a very, very vocal trash talker. Even more than all of this, what really made him famous was his slightly different appearance. Because as just a high schooler, Terry was already losing most of the hair on his head, earning him the nickname Baldhead. This would also lead to many online questioning his real age especially in the comments on his social media posts. Terry's fame would reach its height when during a game against Spire Institute, he would uh, trash talk the young star LaMelo Ball before locking him up during the next play. This fame would be short-lived though, because he would soon find himself fighting way bigger problems in his life. Like I said, his high school career was quite good, but it wasn't good enough to garner real interest from big colleges. He did attract some interest from a big prep school in Minnesota, which he wanted to play for but they didn't have any housing for him. The thing is that Terry had bet everything on joining, so when that plan fell down, he actually found himself having to live in a homeless shelter in Minnesota. He absolutely did not give up on his situation and decided to just start grinding on his own. He would put in daily work in the gym before going back to the shelter at night. This hard work would not go unnoticed as he would get recruited by DME Academy and given a chance in Florida. And he did not let it go to waste. He just balled out and he managed to get the spotlight back on him again, but this time it wasn't because of his looks, it was purely for his skill. The fairy tale would not stop here though, as in 2020, he would get that college call that he so desperately waited for. And no, it wouldn't be any random one, as after all this hard work, Terry succeeded in getting a Division I offer from Cleveland State. He immediately accepted it, and took it as an occasion to turn his life around. While he wasn't the most flamboyant player on the court, his high intensity and hustle plays helped him become a frequent contributor to the team. And even academically, he flourished, as he made the Dean's List in just his freshman year. While dreams of turning pro may be a bit far for him, he still managed to amass an impressive following on social media, with more than 100,000 followers on Instagram, which could present a new career opportunity that may be opening to him. The era of young players' mixtapes has brought us to a point where kids as young as 10 can reach worldwide fame thanks to a good few performances in middle school games. The case of Julian Newman is no different. He would find himself under the spotlight of numerous media outlets because he was one of the best young guys in the world at the moment. He would start making a reputation while playing for Downey Christian Middle School in Florida. He would dominate the competition there, even dropping 91 points in a single game. And so, as just a 4'5", 11-year-old kid, Julian would find himself playing for his school's varsity team, and he would do pretty okay for himself, averaging a solid 12 points 11 assists double-double throughout his first few appearances. The following season was no different. He would up his production to 17 points per game. The ease with which he dominated varsity competition, despite being a 12-year-old kid, quickly turned him into a child star, and he was everywhere. It started with YouTube videos of him getting millions of views, then turned into every news outlet reporting on him, before finally ending up with him getting invited to every big talk show in America. From Steve Harvey to Ellen DeGeneres, Julian was everywhere, with some labeling him as the most marketed 12-year-old kid on the entire planet. He would continue his meteoric rise even in high school, with big performance after big performance. 
As a sophomore, he averaged a crazy 35 points, 7 assists, 5 rebounds, and 4 steals per game. He would play his senior year with Prodigy Prep, a school created by his father, where Jillian would wait to see what college offers he would get. Unfortunately for him, he would not get any significant one. The thing with Julian is that he was 4'5 as an 11 year old. People still bet that he would grow, but unfortunately he would reach his maximum height at just 5'7. That combined with the fact that he had some pretty glaring attitude issues made colleges avoid recruiting him to their programs. This would result in him having to completely turn his life around and shift away from the idea of playing pro basketball. He would focus on developing his prodigy brand all while being a social media star with nearly 700,000 followers on Instagram. This would give him the status to play in star scrimmages like the Creator League where he would actually find quite a bit of success. Overall, he was a child basketball star that reached his peak way too early in his life. But that actually may have been for the best. The family was able to capitalize off his newfound success with TV shows, merch, everything you could think of. And they're all doing pretty well off with the business that they've created. Maybe some of the other viral stars that we talk about later on in this video should have followed the path of maximizing off of their newfound stardom. Back in the day, there was no bigger YouTube channel than Hoops Mixtape. With more than 300 million total views with a bit less than 400 videos, it was by far the leader when it came to posting Hoop Mixtapes. And within all of those videos, there was one guy that was so impressive that his video became the most watched video on that channel with over 16 million views. And so, at just 14 years old, Seventh Woods became an overnight sensation and a household name for his incredible performances on the court. The rest of his high school time at Hammond School would be no different, as he would continue to shine game after game, ending his sophomore season with averages of 20 points, 4 assists, 4 rebounds, and 4 steals per game. This was enough to win him the South Carolina Boys Basketball Player of the Year and earn him a selection into the under-16 U.S. national team. With them, he would go on to win the gold medal in the 2013 FIBA American Under-16 Tournament, which also featured some future NBA players like Jamal Murray. The rest of his time in high school would just be spent between invitational camps and AAU games, with him ending up as a top 15 guard in the country by the time he graduated. This would earn him offers from multiple schools, notably North and South Carolina University. He would choose North Carolina, with whom he would actually have quite a good freshman season as he played a record-tying 40 games in it. Unfortunately, his basketball trajectory would be completely derailed in his sophomore season, as he suffered a foot stress fracture that sidelined him for most of the season. Upon returning, he would not be his former self, so he would find himself behind future NBA player Kobe White on the guard rotation. The thing with Woods is that his story shows us the unfortunate side of when success comes at a young age. In an interview with Sports Illustrated, he would finally share how the mental stress got to him over the years and actually how hard it was for him to be under the spotlight. Just imagine this, you're a 14 year old kid who finds himself becoming a national basketball star. You know that every single one of your plays is going to be scrutinized by analysts all over the country. At that point, playing basketball can become more of a chore than anything else, as you're just doing your best to avoid disappointing people, and that is exactly what happened with Woods. As his level was steadily declining, he would first go closer to home by attending the University of South Carolina before choosing to transfer to Morgan State for his final year to get as far away from the fame as he could. This would greatly help him recover mentally and eventually lead him to go play abroad as he just signed a contract with the UGC Demons to go play in the Irish League. We can only hope that he will be able to get back to where he was and achieve a long career as a pro basketball player even if it's not with the NBA. One type of player that NBA teams absolutely love is super tall guys with raw skills. So when the basketball world started getting wind of a 7'7 guy playing the sport, you better believe that every single scout had their eyes on him. Robert Bobrowski is just that. At just 12 years old, he had already surpassed the 7'2 mark and was getting offers from all over Europe. The Romanian would end up choosing to play in Italy for Stella Azura, where he would start working on his fundamentals and dominate everyone in his age category with his height. Two years later, he would come back to the US to play actual good competition and get his body ready for the physicality of the American style of play. There, he would attend Spire Institute, next to the likes of Lamelo Ball. The thing is though, he would quickly become a phantom member of the roster, as he never participated in any game. Contrary to guys like Taco Fall, Robert's body just couldn't withstand playing games. He was so thin coming to the USA that the coaching staff's priority was just to bulk him up. Unfortunately, some things can't be changed, and his naturally lanky body just couldn't get enough muscle on to truly compete. Not only that, but he kept having a series of back injuries that would ultimately culminate in a scoliosis that would greatly limit his movement. Luckily, his academic success in college and his great ability to learn languages have helped build himself new career opportunities away from the court. 
Did you ever wonder if a grade schooler could become a basketball star? Well, no need to ask because up next, we have a player who became a total sensation at just 10 years old, Jayshawn Augusto. His dad published a video that showed his son's skills and training regime, and it quickly became a viral video, getting national coverage and even appearing on the news. He was quickly labeled to be the best 11-year-old player ever. Not only that, but his dedication at such a young age for the sport made a lot of people want to root for the young guy. After all, he was training more than four hours a day for seven days a week, honing and bettering his craft. Everyone saw him in the true Mamba mentality. Oh, and we can't forget about his innate athleticism and physical ability, as his speed and endurance were something that had not been seen before in the world of sport, with multiple veteran coaches predicting that he could win multiple gold medals in the Olympics. He would continue shining as a middle schooler, even making it to a varsity team despite being so young. As a high schooler though, he would finally get the growth spurt that he so desperately needed getting to a respectable 5'11 and would continue building his legacy. He would end up winning two back-to-back -back state championships and would ultimately end up as a four-star recruit. He would get quite a few college offers but would end up going to Long Island Uni. With the Sharks, he would start settling down into a more basic role and end up averaging just over 11 points per game. He tried his chance by declaring for the 2020 draft, but a combination of his small size, as well as him not having shown any particular flash of genius in college, would make him go undrafted. Still, he wouldn't abandon the sport as he is now a basketball trainer, helping people who are in the same situation as him make it to the big league. And last but not least, we have someone that took over the internet and may be more popular than any of the other guys in this video. But I think you guys already know who he is. The only guy in the video to not fall off and actually make the league, even going number one in 2019. But not all number one picks end up being as great as we think. And there's one guy in the 2010s that may have had a bigger falling off than some of the people in this video. I know, sounds crazy, right? While this video showing on your screen right here may make you think elsewise, 